Hi, this is Sex, Love, and Murder. I'm Aphrodite Jones, your host, along with my co-host, Mike Bergeson. And in this podcast, we are going to be talking about a woman who had so many husbands, you can't even remember all her last names. But in addition to that, she was able to keep two boyfriends at the same time who didn't know about each other. This is how much she loved sex. So this story starts back in 1991 in Orange County, California, where Nanette Johnson, a gorgeous 25-year-old blonde, seemingly had it all. This girl was a stunning model and fell in love with a self-made millionaire whose name was William McLaughlin. He was recently divorced, a father of three, who wanted nothing more than to please her. So within months of meeting this winter-spring relationship had grown serious. Now, Bill had two homes in Tony Newport Beach. He had a bayside bungalow in an exclusive gated community called Balboa Cove. I was there, fabulous place. And that's where he usually stayed with his son, Kevin. The second home he had was a fantastic beach house right on the sand in Newport. And Bill actually invited Nanette along with her two children from her previous marriage, to move into his beachfront home. And of course, Nanette was thrilled. So for Nanette, finding Bill McLaughlin was like hitting the jackpot. The couple took romantic trips together, Bill lavished her with gifts, and even bought Nanette a brand new Cadillac. And within a year of meeting, Bill actually proposed to her. He pops the question, he puts a ring on it, But then 18 months go by and Bill never sets a wedding date. So instead of marriage, Nanette kind of proposes that she becomes Bill's bookkeeper and she becomes his assistant learning the secrets of his business. What McLaughlin didn't know was that his lovely Nanette was about to have a secret of her own because she started an affair with an ex NFL football player named Eric Naposky, and things would get complicated. Within three years of their first having met, William McLaughlin would be shot dead, gunned down inside his own home, shot six times with a nine millimeter handgun. Even though the suspect may have seemed obvious, the case would remain a mystery for years. Listen to this interview the police did with Eric not long after the murder. See, this is where I'm back. Okay. Okay. This is what you need maybe to fill me in. That's the, well, why, why you're looking so hard at me? Okay. As far as relationships, I don't know if she's explaining it since, but Mm-mm. they didn't have a platonic relationship. And you know this for a fact. For a fact. And where do you get your facts from? Family members. Mm-hmm. Nanette. Nanette. She told you this too. Yeah. Okay. In a, in a tape interview, I can, I can get it. This was, no, this was no, no, no way, way shape or form, just a platonic mm-hmm. relationship. Okay. She was having, it was an arrangement, a nice little arrangement with, with Bill. She had a nice little arrangement with and Bill. And what was the arrangement? What do you think the arrangement was? What did it state? Well, let me just, let me just, let me just, they had a sexual relationship. Be sure. Absolutely positive. Absolutely positive. So you can hear in that police interview that Eric is stating he has no idea that Nanette has another relationship. Okay, I just think we have to ask, what kind of arrangement was this really with Naposky? I mean, if he didn't know that she was having sex with someone else, where did he think she was every night? Because she didn't sleep nights with him. So you're saying Nanette didn't sleep nights with Bill? Is what you're saying? No, I'm saying she didn't sleep nights with Eric. She went home to Bill every night. I actually interviewed Bill's daughter, Kim, and she told me that Bill had no intentions of marrying Nanette. So maybe she was cheating with Eric because she was looking for a real relationship there. And perhaps Bill, because she came home to him every night, really wasn't noticing what she was doing during the day because he was really wrapped up in his work. So let's talk a little bit about Bill McLaughlin and just what kind of man he was. Bill grew up in Chicago in a modest family, but friends and family would say that there was always something about Bill that made them think that he was gonna make it big someday. 
And he did make it big once he was in California. But let's get back to his history. So McLaughlin joined the Marines at the age of 18. And once out of the service, he moved to California. And like you said, Af, it would be in California that Bill developed a pharmaceutical device that separated blood from plasma, and this made him a fortune. So by 1990, Bill was a retired Marine, a self-made millionaire, but he was going through a messy divorce from his wife of 25 years. So Bill was undoubtedly a genius inventor, but he may not have been as smart in his personal relationships with women. Yeah, because a year after his divorce, Bill meets Nanette Johnston, and he answers her personal ad that she places in a local Orange County magazine, which for me is hard to imagine why he would respond to this, because the ad was so blatant, and it tells me that Bill was somehow naive when it came to women. Here's what, Because here's what the ad said. Wealthy men only. Classy, well-educated woman knows how to take care of her man. You take care of me, and I'll take care of you. Now, that's so cheesy sounding to me. I don't know how you think about it, Ferg, as a man. What do you think of that? Well, I think this is uh, somebody that's just after money, plain and simple. And how could Bill not see that, or did he not care? I mean, that's something we'll never know. But it's just strange to me that he would respond to that ad. But for whatever reason, he did reach out to Nanette. And you have to know that at the time, McLaughlin was worth an estimated $20 million. So he has a boat. He has a private plane. He was a pilot. He's living the American dream and then some. And at the same time, he falls hard for this young woman who... Not only had he given her his beachfront house to live in, but he also set her up in a bedroom of her own in his bayfront home. So Nanette had to have felt like she won the lottery, Af. I mean, what do you think? I would think that is a huge lottery for somebody who didn't come from much money. Nanette was a gold digger, plain and simple, and she landed herself a whale. Bill was smitten with her, and she's got everything she ever wanted and remember nanette is 24 years younger than bill so there had to be some attraction there for bill in that regard but to me af that's a walking cliche you know we're talking about a man in a midlife crisis he gets divorced and he goes for a younger version and nanette this was a girl who always had craved money She actually left her first husband and told him she was divorcing him because he could not give her the pampered life she felt she deserved. What? I mean, picture that. Who does that? People divorce over money all the time, but who would be so brazen to say she deserves a more lavish life? I mean, what a biatch. Things are going along great for Bill and Nanette until 1993. And that's when Nanette meets 26-year-old Eric Naposky. She meets him at a fitness club where he worked as a personal trainer. We have to talk about Eric, Af. This was a good-looking guy. I can say that. I'm okay with that. Six foot two, 255 pounds. He had been a professional NFL player. And that's a big thing because someone who is an NFL player means Eric was impressive, not only physically, but his history. And with a beautiful blonde Nanette, the two find instant attraction. But there's a kink because Nanette doesn't tell Eric that she's already in a relationship with someone else. And instead, what she does is she tells Eric a story to explain this so-called complex relationship that she has with a man named Bill McLaughlin, but none of it would be true. So what Nanette says is that she worked for Bill and she had helped him develop the device that separated blood from plasma. And this is where Bill had made all his money from this device. But Nanette says to Eric, this is where her wealth came from, from helping Bill develop this device. 
and eventually she and Bill had become business partners. And Naposky would later say that she not only portrayed herself as a wealthy businesswoman and showered him with gifts, with trips, motorcycles, expensive clothing, but he would also say that Nanette actually took on the persona of Bill McLaughlin as though she was the real inventor of this genius idea and that she was the self-made millionaire. So she was a very good actress, you might say. Her relationship with Naposky lasted for more than a year. I think it was almost two years. And during that time, Naposky would see Nanette at the beach house with her kids. He would he was hanging out with them all the while in the dark about her engagement to Bill. So I guess she's hiding the big diamond ring. In a way, it's hard to believe that Eric would buy into it when when she's not available to sleep with him at night. But at the same time, she probably used her children as pawns because that's not beneath her. And he wanted to believe that she was the sugar mama who could take care of all his needs. I spoke to him on the phone and Eric admitted to me that Nanette footed the bill for everything they did together. And Eric didn't have a lot of money at this time. So you have to believe that he was very happy to accept all these lavish gifts from Nanette. And Af, I think this was a great setup for Nanette because Eric didn't ask for much from her. He didn't pressure her to move in with him. Eric was happy to see Nanette on her terms. So let's talk a little more about Naposky because this is a guy who grew up in New York. He's a true New Yorker with that thick New York accent. A football star throughout high school. He earned a scholarship to the University of Connecticut. But Naposky had a hard time getting along with his coaches, and he quit after his junior year after a major disagreement with a coach. He was not selected in the 1988 NFL draft, but he managed to sneak into a tryout with the New England Patriots. And coaches were so impressed with him that they actually signed him to a contract. That's pretty. I mean, that's pretty amazing that he was able to do to accomplish that, don't you think? No, it is amazing, and it was said af that he ran one of the fastest times of all the linebackers from that whole class. But Eric played sparingly in that first year, and he suffered an injury that actually shut down his rookie season. But he comes back the second year, ready to go. But he gets cut from the Patriots after only one game. So you know this was a huge letdown for Eric, not realizing his dreams of making big money in the NFL, and Eric becomes a physical trainer after his football career is over. He moves to California with the hopes of starting an acting career, and this would ultimately lead to him meeting Nanette. Well, I interviewed Eric in jail, and he told me that he and Nanette had plans to make a future together. He told me that Nanette had connections in Hollywood, that she was going to help him with his acting career. And at the same time, he continued to insist that he had no idea that Nanette was involved with Bill as a lover. He believed wholeheartedly that Bill was her mentor and business partner and Remember, Eric has no knowledge about where she's spending her nights. He thinks she's sleeping on the beach at a beach house that she owns. He doesn't know that she's living with Bill. Well, there's no doubt that Nanette is good at keeping things secret. In fact, Nanette and Eric were making plans to get engaged, and eventually they would go house shopping, looking at a million-dollar property in Turtle Rock, near Irvine. So before they went house shopping, going back to the day of the murder, on December 15th, 1994, Bill McLaughlin is returning home from Las Vegas, where he traveled regularly because he was checking on investment properties he had there. And he arrived home around 8 p.m. and his son Kevin is at the door to greet him. But Nanette and her kids are out. She left Bill a note that she'd gone to watch her son's soccer game. 
Now, around 8.30 p.m., Kevin goes upstairs to bed. That's his usual routine. And Bill is looking over some paperwork in his living room. Then he goes to the kitchen to make himself a sandwich, and there's a loud noise. Bill is shot six times in the chest and the abdomen with a 9 millimeter Beretta pistol at close range. Later, the Orange County coroner would confirm that two of these shots were fired from less than two feet away. And then the killer fled from the house completely undetected. And this 9 millimeter Beretta was loaded with hollow point bullets. And these bullets, Af, they cause a tremendous amount of damage. Now, Bill's son, Kevin, was upstairs in the house, like you mentioned, when the shots rang out. And we have to talk about Kevin because he had been hit by a drunk driver and had suffered a head injury causing brain damage. But after hearing the shots, Kevin makes his way downstairs to find his father lying in a pool of blood. He managed to call 911, but could not effectively communicate to the operator because of his impaired speech. When Newport Beach police arrived on the scene, lead detective Thomas Voth begins to search for clues. No weapons or fingerprints are found inside the house. Now, as you can imagine, Kevin was very shaken up, but he was trying to help investigators. But unfortunately, he didn't get a look at the shooter. But police did find something at the scene that struck them as very odd, Ferg. They found two keys to Bill's house One was still inside the lock to the front door, and the other was laying on the ground near the front door. So investigators immediately begin to think that the suspect in this murder had to be someone very familiar with Bill McLaughlin. It had to be an inside job. If Bill hadn't left the keys there himself, which seemed very unlikely, how many different people connected to Bill would have access to the keys to his house? And Bill's son, Kevin, was quickly ruled out as a suspect when they tested his hands for gunshot residue, and those tests came back negative. There was no way that Kevin fired a gun that night. Bill's two daughters and his ex-wife all had airtight alibis and were quickly ruled out as suspects as well. So investigators checked to see if Bill had made any enemies over the years, and they discover one possible suspect. There was a man named Hal Fischel who had been embroiled in a bitter lawsuit with McLaughlin in the past. This lawsuit was over that pharmaceutical device that Bill had developed, the one that made him the multimillionaire. Fischel eventually lost the suit and he had to fork over $9 million to Bill. This type of money conflict would make anyone a suspect. But Fischel also had an alibi. Witnesses placed him in Santa Barbara over 150 miles away on the night of the murder. There was no way that Fischl could have been at McLaughlin's home that night, and he was quickly ruled out. The number of people close to Bill that could have possibly killed him was starting to dwindle fast. And now, investigators had to turn their attention to Bill's fiancée, Nanette Johnston. But picture this. On the night of the murder... Nanette returned to Bill's house around 10 p.m. to find the place surrounded by police cars. It was chaos. And she tried to enter the home. She tried to go inside and see Bill, but police wouldn't let her in. And when they tell her that McLaughlin had been shot dead, Nanette still wants to get in there. She wants to see the body. She's in shock. She's devastated. When questioned by police, Nanette tells them that she'd been at her son's soccer game that night, and then afterwards, she had gone to the South Coast Plaza Mall to do some Christmas shopping. She even had receipts to prove it. She tells detectives that she has no idea who on earth would want Bill dead. But police would soon learn about Nanette's secret boyfriend, Eric Naposky. And as they started to investigate, they learned that the two didn't appear to be going to great lengths to keep their affair all that secretive. Witnesses placed Naposky with Nanette at her son's soccer game the night of the murder. But the romance had been kept secret enough that the family of Bill McLaughlin was shocked to find out that Nanette had this boyfriend on the side. 
But the thing is, Eric Naposky didn't know that this was a secret romance. He thought that Nanette was his girlfriend. And remember, she had told Eric that Bill was a business partner. She never revealed he was her fiancé. So to Eric, he's the main man. Of course they'd be out in public and not try to hide this. Nanette Johnston and Eric Naposky, they were suspects in the murder of Bill McLaughlin from very early on. Detectives not only knew that the two were having an affair behind Bill's back, but they also learned that Nanette had been writing checks to herself from Bill's account without his permission. Yeah, and that would later come back to bite her. But in the meantime, police bring Eric in for questioning, and at first, he's very evasive about his answers regarding his relationship with Nanette. Police eventually pinned him down on the fact that he owned a 9mm Beretta handgun, the same type that was used to kill Bill McLaughlin. But when they asked him where the gun was, Eric tells them that he has no idea where it is. Now, I interviewed Eric over and over again, and he said that he'd been evasive about the handgun with police because the gun wasn't really his. According to him, that was Nanette's handgun. And he didn't want to tell police that because he didn't want to put suspicion onto Nanette for the murder. Eric did give his version of that night's events to police. He said he was with Nanette at her son's soccer game, and then they both left. He told police that Nanette told him she was going to go do some shopping. And Eric said that he had to go to his night job as a bouncer at a bar called the Thunderbird. Now, what Eric claimed was that while on his way to the Thunderbird, he got a page from one of his bosses and he pulled into a Denny's restaurant in Tustin to make a call. And this would be very important later on because Eric would claim that he used his calling card. Remember when they had those back in the 1990s? I had I had some calling cards. And that statement would prove, Eric claimed, that he placed the call from Tustin, California at 8.52 p.m. So he tells the police in his interview that Tustin is 20 minutes away from Newport Beach, so there's no way he could have been at Bill's house at the time of the murder. Nanette was questioned by police as well on January 19, 1995. In the interview, she too was very evasive about her relationship with Naposky. But at one point, she did admit she was embarrassed about having two lovers at the same time. Detectives asked Nanette whether she knew if Eric had any guns, and she answered no to that question. She was also asked whether she had ever been to a gun range with Eric, and she answered no to that question as well. Yeah, so both Johnston and Naposky were questioned about the murder in 1995, but neither were arrested at the time. They were not even charged. Incredibly, Johnston would end up pleading guilty in 1996 to forgery and grand theft charges for stealing nearly $500,000 from McLaughlin's accounts. She stole a half a million dollars, and he didn't realize it. And Nanette would end up with a one-year sentence for the conviction and wind up, and would serve 180 days. Despite this evidence against Nanette and the suspicions of Naposky, there were two different district attorneys who reviewed the case, and neither of them felt that there was enough evidence to charge them with murder. So this case would go cold for close to 13 years, Ferg. Now, during this time, the couple would break up and go their separate ways. But Johnston would quickly marry another wealthy man, John Packard, and she had a child with him. But that relationship ended in divorce when Packard discovered that she was cheating on him. And of course, being the gold digger that she was, Nanette didn't wait long for that divorce to be finalized before she found another wealthy businessman, Bill McNeil. And she would marry McNeil and have yet another child to seal that deal. 
and set up house in a town called Ladera Beach. So now here she is living in a cushy lifestyle, an Orange County housewife, and the life she always aspired to. Yeah, F, I mean, she's part of the PTA, she's a soccer mom, and she's married to a man who has no clue about her former relationship with Bill McLaughlin and the murder case that had made headlines years earlier. To everyone around her, Nanette is a friendly woman. And most of all, she's a doting wife and mother. You know, it's hard to believe that she was able to pull off this completely new life where her past was entirely behind her. I don't know, F. I think she's a chameleon. Yeah, I agree. I mean, she totally changed her image and had everyone believing that she was this wonderful woman. And as for Eric Naposky, he would make a home for himself in Connecticut where he worked as a personal trainer. He would have two children of his own and get engaged to a school teacher in Greenwich. The two were soon to be married and Eric thought his past was behind him, but his past would come bubbling up again in a big way. In 2009 in Greenwich, Naposky is placed under surveillance for several days because by that time, Orange County prosecutors had reopened the case and had been working it for two years. They now felt they had enough evidence to bring justice to Bill McLaughlin and his family. On a quiet suburban street in Greenwich on May 20th, 2009, four squad cars pull Eric over and order him to lie face down on the ground. Naposky is arrested for murder. After Eric is arrested, authorities wanted him to call Nanette and they wanted him to allow them to listen in on this conversation in the hopes that she would incriminate herself. Eric refused to cooperate and authorities extradited him to Orange County. You got to wonder why he's covering for Nanette at this point, because he later claims that she framed him. Getting back to that same day that Eric Naposky was arrested, 3,000 miles away in Ladera Beach, Detective Byington of the Newport Beach Police knocks on Nanette's doorstep to say something that he had waited years to say. He tells Nanette Johnston that she's under arrest for murder. And just like it's nothing, Nanette says to him, what murder? And she's led away in handcuffs. And the cop actually says to Nanette, Af, I don't know if you've been involved in other murders, but I'm here for the murder of Bill McLaughlin. Yeah, I mean, there may have been other murders as far as this cop's concerned, because he doesn't know what she's been up to for all these years that she's been running around. And with her, really, who knows? But in her view, her hands are totally clean regarding the murder of Bill. Now, there are two separate trials for Eric Naposky and Annette Johnston that happened in 2011. And they would draw national media attention because, let's face it, this is a story that has all the ingredients of a sensational murder case. You have a former NFL player, a sexy gold digger, who are allegedly conspiring to kill a millionaire businessman. Eric would later swear that it was impossible that he could have killed Bill. All throughout the trial, Eric proclaimed his innocence. He contested that it was impossible that he could have killed McLaughlin. And he felt the prosecution had no case that if anything, he really was being framed. Naposky was the first to go on trial. And the prosecution's case was built on the fact that Eric Naposky was manipulated into murdering Bill McLaughlin by Nanette Johnston. One thing that came out at trial was that Nanette had told Eric prior to the murder that Bill was sexually assaulting her. The prosecution used this to show the jury just how manipulative Nanette could be. Now, the prosecution's star witness was a woman named Suzanne Kogar, who was a neighbor to Naposky back in the mid-1990s. Kogar testified that Eric confided in her and said that Bill McLaughlin was sexually assaulting Nanette and that he was planning to do something about it. This neighbor 
testified that Eric was so upset about the alleged sexual abuse that he threatened to blow up Bill McLaughlin's plane. Now, when I interviewed Eric in jail, he swore up and down that Nanette claimed that she'd been raped by Bill at gunpoint. And he said he was just blowing off steam at the time. He didn't deny his conversation with Suzanne Kogar, but he said he was just venting. He did admit to saying that he was going to blow up Bill's plane, but he said he was just joking. He was kidding around. Another damning piece of testimony came when Suzanne Kogar recounted a conversation that she had had with Eric weeks after the murder. In that conversation, she came out and just flat asked Eric if he had anything to do with the murder. Eric's response was to smile and say, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. He tells Suzanne that if police contact her, she should deny that she even knows him. Kogar tells the jury that Naposky hinted that he might have had someone else do the murder. So she testifies that she was so afraid of Eric that she didn't go to police at the time and instead waited for a few years and called in an anonymous tip in 1998. And this was a tip that fell between the cracks. It would take years of investigative work to track her down. But when they did, Kogar gave investigators the statement that they needed because it included the biggest nail in Naposky's coffin. Suzanne Kogar tells police that Eric said the killer used the same type of gun that he used to have. He says, this is why the police think I did it. The importance of that was pivotal because the only people who knew about what type of gun was used in this murder in the weeks following that murder were the police and the killer. But did Naposky ever really say that? Because that statement would be vehemently denied in court and it would turn out to be a he said, she said situation. There were questions as to why Kogar never went to police with that information when the case was all over the news in 1995. Yeah, and the way Eric explained the whole thing with this gun to me, he said he once owned a Beretta, but he loaned it to a friend who lived in Hollywood. And he had come up with a theory that this gun was used by a hitman who Nanette had hired. Now, it was a very strange conversation that we had Supposedly, they met at a, at a diner, the three of them, this alleged hitman, Nanette and Eric. But when I pressed Eric to name this hitman, Naposky was not going to do it. He insisted that there was this murder for hire plot. He claimed he was there and overheard the conversation between Nanette and her Hollywood friend. But he was not going to give that name up. So he wouldn't name the other potential suspect, Af. But he sits across from you and wants you to believe him just based on his word. And I asked him about that. I wanted that name. And finally, when I pressured him about it, he said, you know, I don't want to point the finger and get sued. That was his answer. He said that at the time he was actually working on proof about this alleged hitman. He was working with detectives or private investigators about finding this alleged hitman. And I mean, was your BS meter going off high at this point? Yeah. If you could have seen my face when I had to keep a straight face listening to this guy because he actually believed his own BS and I had to play along with it. So the thing is, prosecutors back at the trial are quick to point out that the ballistics show that the gun that was used to kill Bill McLaughlin was in fact a nine millimeter Beretta, the very same type of gun that Eric admitted to owning at one time. They also put a witness on the stand, an employee from a hardware store who testifies, get this Ferg, that Naposky had asked him to build a silencer for a Beretta. And it was supposedly for him to use in a movie shoot. 
So he asked a hardware store guy to build a silencer. Did the guy do it? No. The Ace Hardware guy got spooked, but he did testify. Eric's defense at trial, they hung their hat on the alibi that Eric gave to police back during his initial interview. And that was that he could not have committed the murder because he was 20 minutes away from Bill's house making a phone call at that Denny's restaurant in Tustin, California. The problem that Eric and his defense team had was that Eric no longer had the statement for the calling card that he used back in 1994. Police didn't request it back then, and the company was unable to provide that information for the trial in 2011. And Eric kept stressing to me over and over that this phone record was his alibi. He believed that somehow he could eventually get a copy of it. You know, I don't know how you're going to do that with phone companies, AT&T and whoever people used to get phone calling cards, how you're going to get a record of that. But he's, you know, holding out all hopes that all these years later, something is going to exonerate him. But Af, prosecutors put forth that it doesn't even matter whether Eric made the call at 852 or not because their investigators timed the drive a bunch of different times and they found that Eric could have still made that drive in time to kill McLaughlin. Yes, between 852 and the time that McLaughlin was killed, which was approximately 9, 10 p.m., that would be just enough time for him to make it there. Regardless, as you say, this proof that Eric says he ha- would have, he didn't have. And I can only say that my belief is that Eric called Nanette, not from Tustin, but from the Thunderbird nightclub, because that's where he worked, and that was near Bill's house. It was so near, I made the drive myself, and it took about five minutes to get to Bill's house from the Thunderbird. So when prosecutors theorized about what happened on the night of the murder, I tend to agree with them completely. What they said is that just after the soccer game, they believe Nanette dropped Eric off at his Tustin apartment where he picked up his gun and his work clothes. They believe that it was Nanette who drove Eric to the Balboa Cove complex and and she dropped him off there. Then she headed to the South Coast Plaza Mall where she purchased some kind of knickknack gift just before 10 p.m. It would have been easy for Eric to murder Bill McLaughlin and then walk right across the highway to report to his job over at the Thunderbird. How far is the walk, Af? It's no more than 10 minutes. And the thing is, he could slide into the nightclub undetected as if he'd been there earlier than what time he was supposed to punch in. As far as motive, prosecutors offered up evidence that this was all about the money. Nanette and Eric were house shopping in the weeks before Bill's murder, and the prosecution asked the question of how two people who essentially had little to no money to their name could afford to buy a house. Now, that answer is very simple. They couldn't afford to buy a house unless they were planning on getting the money from Bill's life insurance policy and his will. Prosecutors also had evidence that showed that Naposky had a notebook with Bill McLaughlin's license plate number written in it just days after the murder. They found this in his apartment. So this is a piece of evidence that his defense could not wipe away. They could not offer up any explanation for that. I mean, why would Eric have that license plate number unless he was tailing Bill McLaughlin. Yeah, Af, the only reason I can think of for Eric having that is because he's planning on murdering Bill McLaughlin. On July 14th, 2011, the jury took just seven hours to find Eric Naposky guilty of first-degree murder in the shooting death of William McLaughlin. The jury also found special circumstance allegations that Naposky committed the murder for financial gain and that he discharged a firearm in the process of committing the crime. For this, Naposky was sentenced to life in prison 
without the possibility of parole. And apparently, Af, Naposky was a real ass during this trial because one of the jurors would come out later and say that they couldn't believe how Eric acted in court. He would laugh and snort at the prosecution as they made their case. So he wasn't doing himself any favors with the jury by the way he was acting during this trial. And even with me in jail, as he was waiting for his sentencing, Eric was so smug. He was so sure that I believed him when he said he was innocent. And he's telling me I'm going to track down the killer. I'm going to prove who really pulled the trigger that night. I mean, he was absolutely certain that his conviction was going to be overturned and that Nanette and her Hollywood friend, the hitman, were going to be the ones convicted of this murder. And as Nanette's trial begins, Deputy District Attorney Matt Murphy tells jurors that Eric Naposky was the shooter, but that it was Johnston that talked him into committing the murder. The prosecution contended that Johnston wanted McLaughlin dead so that she could collect a million dollars in life insurance, $150,000 from his will, his high-end infinity car, and also have unlimited access to his beach house. What Murphy did is he highlighted the fact that, remember, Nanette had pled guilty to stealing a half a million dollars from McLaughlin, which happened before and after the murder occurred. So she's writing checks to herself before Bill is killed and after he's killed. The prosecutor contended that Nanette had to have McLaughlin killed so that he would not discover these two very important facts. One, that she was stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from his bank accounts, and two, that she was cheating on him with the very good-looking and buff Eric Naposky. The prosecution laid out the argument that Nanette convinced her lover Naposky to murder Bill so that the two of them could share in this windfall of cash. They theorized that it was Nanette who provided Naposky with keys to McLaughlin's home so that he could get in there undetected and surprise Bill, shoot him, and then escape before ever being seen. Nanette's public defender agreed that she had cheated, lied, and stolen. But he countered the prosecution's argument that she was the mastermind behind the murder, instead saying that it was Naposky that had committed the murder on his own because of his insane jealousy. The defense laid out a theory that Naposky wanted Johnston all to himself, and the only way for him to accomplish this was to get Bill McLaughlin out of the way. They focused in on the fact that Nanette had a solid alibi, she was at her son's soccer game, and then she went shopping on the night of the murder. As far as her alibi on the night of the murder, yes, she was at the soccer game earlier on. But when she says she was shopping at the Costa Mesa Mall, the fact is there was only one receipt from her Christmas shopping, and that was for a knickknack that she bought very quickly just before 10 p.m. So in essence, it becomes a shaky alibi. It becomes something that looks like she did it just to give police a time stamp as to her being somewhere else when she really wasn't that very far away from Balboa Cove. Yeah, if I was thinking, who in the hell goes to the mall during Christmas shopping, 10 p.m., and buys one little knickknack? Exactly. It doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, then there's something behind it. So her defense also laid out that she had no reason to want William McLaughlin dead because at the time of the murder, these two were engaged to be married. And the defense tells the jury that the money that Bill was providing to Nanette would end upon his death. So since Nanette had no marketable skills, she was no longer any model. She's living solely off the money that Bill gave to her. Why would she want to kill her sugar daddy? This is what the defense was arguing. And her defense attorney would actually make a statement to that, quote, if you're motivated by money, you're not going to kill the golden goose to be with the pauper. And Eric Domposky was the pauper. Let's face it, he was a kept man. 
But Matt Murphy would contradict this statement with one of his own, saying that Bill McLaughlin was worth a thousand times more to her dead than he was alive. Nanette would become the trustee of the estate and she would have access to all the money. So she becomes the golden goose. This is what Murphy rebuts when Nanette's defense team claims that she's not going to financially benefit. At one point in the trial, Nanette's defense tried to make a big deal about how the surveillance tape at the mall that she went shopping at that night had been destroyed. Murphy had a response to that too, which was, what difference does it make? We already know that she was not the shooter. So it really doesn't matter if she was at the mall or not. Right. You know, I interviewed Matt Murphy and I got to tell you, he is one sharp prosecutor who, to my knowledge, has never lost a murder case. At the trial, Murphy played the taped interview of detectives sitting down with Nanette about a month after the murder. And on that tape, I could hear her answering no to all the questions that detectives asked her about guns. For example, Nanette answered no to one particular question about whether or not she'd ever been to a gun range with Naposky. And Matt Murphy jumped on this at trial by calling Naposky's former roommate, this guy named Leonard Jomsky, to the stand. And Jomsky testifies that he had gone to a gun range with both Nanette and Naposky and that Naposky was showing them both how to shoot at that range. The other thing that Murphy would point out at trial is that phone records showed that Nanette, get this, on the night of the murder, placed only one call from her car phone. Remember car phones? We didn't have cell phones back then, but some people who were fancy like Nanette had car phones. Remember those? I remember them in movies and TV shows, but I wasn't rich enough to have one. Okay, neither was I. So she places a call from her car phone, and that call lasted about four minutes. This is what the phone records show, which is just about the amount of time it would take for her to drive from that crime scene over to that nightclub where Eric was working. The prosecution believes that Nanette picked Eric up just after the murder. But let me be clear. Naposky's team says he never got a call from her that night, that he never knew where Bill lived, and Eric confirmed this to me, that it was Nanette alone who's responsible for Bill's death. So when I interviewed Eric in jail, he swore to me on his children that Matt Murphy was wrong, that he was at work at the Thunderbird nightclub all night and had showed up for work before the murder. Now, I asked him about whether there could be proof of that, and he said normally he would park his car at the valet, but that night he got there before the valet arrived, so he didn't have a timestamp from the valet. Now, how convenient is that, Ferg? Uh, it fits right in. That's how convenient it is. Well, another thing that fits in is that the guy at the Tustin hardware store also testified that Naposky had gone in there and made a duplicate key. Now, why is that important? Well, we know there was a key in the door lock of McLaughlin's house at Balboa Coves, but there was that second key on the ground, which seemed a little bit confusing at first to me, but I learned that that key was a key that belonged to the community gate, in other words, a pedestrian gate, I walked up to that gate so that you could walk into the community, but you had to be an owner of the community to have that key and it had written on it, cannot be duplicated. So somebody had to hand Naposky that second key. I wonder who that was. Gee, let's think, could her name start with an N? I go Nanette for 200 F. <laughs> I'll see you in Double Down. The jury only needed three hours of deliberation to return a guilty verdict against the net for the murder of Bill McLaughlin. And they would also agree to the special circumstances allegation 
that the murder was committed for financial gain. It also turns out that Nanette and Eric took a honeymoon of sorts in San Francisco after the murder. And when they returned to Newport, they lived together in Bill's beach house. So they thought they were going to live together happily ever after. Now, when I later interviewed Kim McLaughlin, she told me that Nanette was like the evil stepmother who got to win because for 14 years, she eluded arrest and caused immeasurable pain and anger to the McLaughlin family. But in the end, Nanette Johnston was also sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for her masterminding the murder of William McLaughlin. This woman is such a cold-blooded killer that she showed no emotion whatsoever as the judge handed down her life without parole sentence. And she refused to look at the McLaughlin family as they gave their impact statements. This is what his daughter Kim said directly to Nanette in court. She said, your destructive trail of deceit is astounding. The fact that you, Nanette, destroyed so many lives, including my dad's, is vile. You had absolutely no right to take him from us for your own selfish reasons. And she reminds Nanette that her dad was incredibly good to her for four years. I mean, how do you kill a man who has taken care of you, who has given you the world for four years. So Af, there's a question that's been nagging me this whole time. And I go back to why would Bill McLaughlin answer an ad, reach out to a woman like Nanette Johnston? I mean, the guy was worth millions and millions of dollars. I mean, he could have gone to any one of the valid dating services, including some specifically designed for millionaires. And he probably would have found an unbelievable pre-qualified match. Well, I hate to say this, but it almost seems like because he saw a photo of Nanette in that ad, and by the way, in it, she's wearing a sexy negligee. And for him, he didn't want to think about it. That's all he needed. He was looking for arm candy and female companionship. And frankly, for the four years that he was with Nanette, Bill never felt like he was in danger, nor did his family. There weren't like there were telltale signs about this woman. Nanette Johnston was so cunning and calculating that she was not only able to steal from Bill right under his nose, but she was able to plot and plan his murder, and he never saw it coming. Now, As for Nanette, by the way, she wrote to me from prison, Ferg, and surprise, surprise, she claimed she was totally innocent. I really don't think she'll ever admit to her part in this, but if, Nanette, you're ever willing to talk, I'm ready and waiting for you. Nanette, you still have my number, so give me a call. I'm Aphrodite Jones. And I'm Mike Ferguson. And you've been listening to Sex, Love, and Murder. And if you like the show, please subscribe, rate and review us on iTunes or your favorite Android app. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. You can find us on Facebook by searching Sex, Love, and Murder. Our handle on Twitter is at SLM Podcast. And we'd love to get your emails. Send us an email at sexloveandmurder at gmail.com. Yes, we'd love, love, love to hear from you. And remember, this is Sex, Love, and Murder, the place where love and insanity are more connected than people think.